Hello and welcome to CRE Talks, a video series created by ICBR in Korea, Indiana, where we talk with industry experts and innovators in commercial real estate and related fields. Today's episode is focusing on higher education trends, both in the classroom with respect to real estate studies and the housing needs for future college students. Our guests are Chris Cockrum from FC Tucker in Bloomington. He's also an IU Kelly School of Business adjunct professor and Andy Robeson from Purdue University. Andy is the Director of Facilities for University Residences. Welcome Andy and Chris. Again, Chris, we wanna thank you for joining us today and sharing some of your expertise. And we'll start off by just asking for you to take a moment and share why you um, like to teach and how you got involved in working with IU students. Well, great, well, thank you so much. Um, so probably five years ago, I, I had left the corporate real estate industry. And when I was uh, getting back into the brokerage industry, I also knew that I, I would like to, to plug back into Indiana University and possibly the Kelly program. So first thing I did is I made it known that I had an interest in teaching. Uh, and so I, I, I knew several uh, professors over there and just let them know. Nothing happened right away. And then a couple of years later, there was an opportunity for me to come in and teach a basic real estate course, which was R300, which is the principles of real estate. And it's open to all the students in the university, not just Kelly students. So it's an elective and basically just uh, was able to have a 15 week course. Uh, and I've taught that now for four years. Uh, and I have about 50 students in each class. And these are students that just have an interest in real estate. Uh, many times my first question to them is how many want to be a broker? How many want to, you know, learn the process and, you know, be an investor and how many just want to learn how to buy a house someday. And really it's three, three, it's, it's thirds. I have a third that want to be brokers, a third that would like to be an investor and third that just wants to know the real estate process. Uh, so I try to teach it that way. Two years ago, I was actually uh, given the opportunity to teach another class, which is F428 and F429, which is the commercial real estate workshop. So I'm now the director of the commercial real estate workshop. And this is an entirely different group of kids. These are Kelly majors. Um, they are typically a finance real estate major. And these are students that are extremely passionate about the real estate industry and really are striving for careers in real estate. Yeah, it's great to put another dimension to you as a broker where you are not only known uh, throughout the state as a broker in commercial real estate, but that you're also working um, with the college students and, and guiding them within um, the classroom, but also getting that hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. What would you say uh, drives interest for students to, um, to seek that industry, the commercial real estate industry, and to look at it as a profession. It's interesting because uh, I also, I do, I do several seminars throughout Kelly School about careers in real estate. Um, and one of the things that I do is uh, in the very beginning of the, the lecture is I'll, I put a skyline in New York where there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of buildings, high rises. And I always mention when I look at that skyline, I just see so many real estate jobs. I see asset managers, I see bankers, I see leasing agents, I see facility managers, uh, I see property managers. So just, I think introducing the students to uh, the different jobs within real estate and the careers and the income potential, uh, because I also am very transparent and show the different income potential uh, amongst these jobs. So the students can really pick and know what they're getting into. Um, but what I really think drives them is it's, um, it's fun. Real estate's fun. It's, it's, it's fun to be a part of. And I think they see that. Yeah, that's great that you can be a mentor starting in college to the, the students. And I think um, that can go a long way and sticks with a lot of people years and decades after they've um, entered the workforce. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some ways that established brokers could really be helping mentor um, those that are joining the industry, maybe it's after they've changed jobs or changed careers and entered commercial real estate, um, or maybe it's straight from college. So a, a couple of things. So there's a couple of different stages there. So in, in college, in um, college students definitely could use um, opportunities for interns. And it's hard, I'll be honest with you. I'm so caught up in my business and I teach 
I have a student that's now working with us. Um, and in fact, I have two other, I have another one that just joined, I'm, I'm adding another one, but it takes time to create a system for internships. Um, and they can be so valuable. If you can figure out the time and, and find the time to figure out how you could really utilize their services to where it's a win-win. So for example, I have a, a student that, that took my R300 class. He's not a real estate major, but he absolutely loves the industry and he wants to get involved. And he called me for a year asking if he could be my intern. And I met with him, but I just couldn't figure out how to incorporate him in. And he's such a great kid. And I, and I, and it's just his pure persistence. And finally I said, well, come on in, we'll figure it out. So I had him come in and it's easier than you think. So I, one of the things that we do is a lot of data mining. Um, you know, we'll take a listing in Lafayette or Terre Haute and we need to have contacts. So I've actually put him in charge of uh, say Lafayette right now. He's building a database for us uh, in Lafayette of, you know, contact people, email lists, phone numbers, and he's focused on that. And that's hugely valuable in our industry. So he's bringing value to us. So when I get a, you know, a, a nice size listing up there, I instantly have a contact in a market that I can get to in the local area as well as throughout the state. Um, so he brought that value in. Um, he also, so the other thing too in my office is he sits at our conference table. So he's able to be a part of the negotiations of the transactions. He gets to hear how they're how they're negotiated, how listings are negotiated. He gets to just be around the atmosphere of it to where he can just learn and hear, and which is a great way for him to learn. He gets to see live transactions happening. The other hard part is, and I get this question a lot, if somebody's changing careers, how do they get up to speed in commercial brokerage? And that's hard. I guess the thought on uh, that, it all depends on where the broker is or the new broker is financially because it takes a little while to pick it up. But if you could find a team or if you could find someone that's just as passionate about real estate and find a friend within the industry that can kind of take you under your wing, that, that could be one way to do it. If you're a young broker just getting in and you may not have had the exposure that, say, Kelly School gave you, um, I would suggest, um, and what I tell a lot of these young brokers is, uh, and it's their first career, is don't move out of your parents' basement just yet. Keep your expenses down low. Um, and, and be in a market where you're a little bit well-known. Um, so if I'm from Indianapolis, I might want to stick around Indianapolis because it's going to make it a little bit easier than if I were to move to Chicago and want to be a broker and kind of start from scratch. What else would you say commercial real estate brokers need to know about how they can support thriving to have college towns be thriving? As far as brokers, um, you know, many of them work with these uh, multifamily developers here in town and, and help them work through their issues. So how they can help small towns is they can help any of their towns that they live in. It's just be great consultants um, and help these companies as they get through. Uh, we went from the top of the market to the bottom of the market in about eight hours. Uh, and then it's lasted for a lot longer than we'd hoped. So, you know, just being great consultants um, and also, you know, you know, once they feel comfortable enough with COVID, you know, go back and visit your hometown, come back to the ball games, send your, send your kids to the college town, go spend money in the town um, because these towns really need it. They're very dependent on it. Chris, I think I've learned um, a lot today by listening to you and I appreciate your passion for not only commercial real estate in the industry, but also uh, building relationships with those future brokers and um, those that are going to be somewhat in the industry or in the field of a related field. So thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Lisa. We'll just jump into questions. Could you start by speaking to what the expectations of college students and their families have with respect to safe, safety and security for the residence halls at the university? Of course, uh, this is a growing area. The expectations for safety and security have been increasing at, almost exponentially. Uh, the old days of a student getting dropped off at the corner of the residence hall and moving in themselves are over. Uh, parents are very protective of this generation and students are still very tied to their parents. So moving into the residence hall away from home is a physical act as well as an emotional act. And the parents especially are very concerned about the student safety. In most cases, the parents expect the residence hall and on-campus housing to be more safe than their own home. Uh, 
and there's some things that we've done to, to obviously make it a safe environment. We want the buildings to be safe, livable, a place to uh, call home and to study and to have make friends and make connections. That's part of making someone feel comfortable. It's actually a basic part of one of my favorite psychological theories, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And all of us in the housing business, we, we need to meet the basic needs of clean, healthy, safe, well-maintained buildings, but then also those higher level functions of making a place comfortable for people to make friends and to study and to make, make connections. Yeah, we definitely know that college life is complex. And um, let's turn to what trends you're seeing. What would you describe as some of the on and off campus housing accommodations that um, you're dealing with on a daily basis and looking into the future? There's a couple of A words that I could use. Uh, number one is amenitizing. So in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of new builds and those developers have focused on amenities. Who's got the best uh, swimming pool? Who's got the best hot tub? Um, who's got the best retail outlets on the ground floor of their facility? And so that's been the draw for some off-campus locations to upgrade the, the off-campus housing experience. On the university side with university housing, we've been using an A word, uh, academicizing. So how can we bring more academic resources into the residence halls that would fully support the educational enterprise? And I think on campus and off campus housing professionals, we all agree that we support the basic needs of students. But on the off campus, I think those are catering to more upper class students who might like those amenities as one more step towards independence. But the on-campus experience, we have firmly planted our flag in the academicizing world. And so we now have a residence hall here at Purdue called the Honors College and Residences. And the almost the entire first floor is faculty offices and classrooms. So 20 years ago, to have a building that blends housing and academics was unheard of, but now, Students can literally walk downstairs in their, in their, uh, I don't want to say in their pajamas, but literally they could go to class in their pajamas or, or see their professor on the first floor of their residence hall. We know that it's an ever-changing world um, as we move forward and um, want to look at specifics that Purdue is preparing for in the housing and facility world in the next few years. And um, specific to the Boilermakers? We have a great tradition of on-campus housing. Uh, our modern housing really started in the late 1920s with the uh, building of Cary Quadrangle. And our inventory spans 1929 construction all the way up to 2020 construction. Now we've gone in our older buildings, we've gone in sometimes multiple times and done extensive renovations. And for us, the primary renovation that we do is renovate the bathroom, uh, gut the entire bathroom and rebuild it with a premium on privacy. So the old concept of gang showers uh, really is no more. Uh, we now have private shower stalls, private toilet stalls. And so it's a shared bathroom environment now not so much a common or gang style. And then our recent new construction that we have, we're not, we're not building what I call double loaded corridors much anymore. Uh, and a double loaded corridor is a, is a long hallway with double rooms along both sides, and then one of those shared bathrooms. This, this construction is tried and true, and it's the best for building community for freshmen and sophomore students. And those buildings are where we've gone in and upgraded the bathrooms. So we still have the old footprint, but with the new bathroom amenities. And then, uh, but our new buildings are focused on suite style living or what we call pod living, where there is a single, double or triple room, 
and you feel like you're in a small uh, 15 to 25 person hub and then those rooms all dump out onto a common living room and then there's a choice of either a shared bathroom or a couple of um, private um, one toilet one shower type bathrooms and so that also helps foster community building on those floors. The public and private partnerships continue to grow. Can you expand on what is taking place and where you think things will go in the future? Sure. Uh, I think there's there's two levels of public-private partnership. Uh, one is local, and it's where, like for example, here at Purdue, we had a surge in enrollment. We wanted to offer that on-campus living experience and all the amenities and academicized programs that come with it. So we master leased a few apartment complexes in the, in the area. We've had several good partners in that area. We were able to increase our housing stock by over a thousand beds by doing that. Uh, that was simply a year to year agreement and a partnership. The bigger, the bigger definition of public private partnerships it's a funding vehicle that is starting to catch on in the collegiate housing market. Um, it's, a legal, it's a legal contract between universities and developers slash operator companies. There's over a dozen of these in the higher ed world. Um, these first start, these public private partnerships first started in municipalities that would contract with a company to run their energy or run their water systems or to build their roads and maintain their roads. And now this model is starting to bridge over into university housing operations. So for universities that cannot take out more bonds to build their own buildings, they can partner with a P3 company and to legally build and own the building and then lease back space to the university for their academic or residential needs. There's a lot of different varieties of P3 partnerships. It can be as simple as working with your own university foundation to use their money to build and own a building and then lease the space back to the academic side of the university all the way up to a privately held P3 firm building, owning, and operating, doing all the maintenance and all the cleaning of the residence hall, whereas that in the past would have been more of an in-house function by the university. Andy, this has been very informative to learn more about what Purdue University is doing and um, looking globally at the university housing um, and, and higher education at that. Andy, we want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your knowledge um, with us and your insights. It's been very um, helpful, I think, to Indiana's commercial real estate brokers. So thank you. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed our talk. We thank Chris and Andy for being a part of CRE Talks and sharing their valuable insights into the future of higher education. That will do it for today's episode. Be on the lookout for future episodes in your email and our social media channels. Until next time, thanks for joining.